I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. You know, the value of real farms and cities is going down due to the eco-eco disaster of degradation of the ecology and deflation in the economy. But the value of virtual farms and cities is going up. How can this be? Stacey Herbert, tell us all about it. Yes, Max, there's a global conflict going on between real and fake. We can't tell the difference anymore between real value and fake value. Carlisle Group lost $105 million on a fictional Chinese forestry company, and it will make the same mistake again. The name of this forest company is called China Forestry, and it was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange for $1 billion. One of the biggest private equity investors was Carlisle Group, you know, the very connected private equity group with all the bushes and the bakers of the world uh, on the board of directors. So China Forestry had a business model which consisted of fast growth forestry to extract greenhouse gas credits, a business model that barely made sense to some analyst guys that looked at it. However, it was a business model that made sense if the company had enough guanzi, which is uh, nepotism, connections, that the West refers to how China operates. So enough connections to extract a really bad deal from the Chinese government. But it turns out that the shares have been suspended due to accounting irregularities, and analyst gossip is that the bulk of the forest do not actually exist. Right, so the crony capitalism, the Guanzi, has value, and that's what gave it the money cash appeal but there are no forests there but if there were forests there they were buying and selling them based on carbon credits which is a virtual currency that doesn't yet exist either so you've got three layers of phantasmagorical <laughs> economic shenanigans you've got non-existent carbon credits based on selling and buying air You've got Kwanzi, which is the crony capitalism monetized in a corrupt Chinese economy. And then you've got Carlyle Group buying into using their fiat money, the US dollar, which is based on nothing, has no intrinsic value, into both the virtual Kwanzi and the non-existent forest. It sounds kind of like Ponzi when you say it. <laughs> Yes, it does, doesn't it? The Kwanzi Ponzi. Well, according to my experts on Twitter, they say it's either Kwanji or Guanzi. You know, it reminds me of those little noodles I used to get on West 97th Street in New York with the, come with the little peanut sauce and a side order of wedges of lime, which were very nice. Apparently, this isn't the only fake company that um, Carlisle Group is involved in in China. The gossip is that they're also invested in China Agritech, which is listed on the NASDAQ and has business concerns, according to their data, uh, in China. But analysts cannot find any convincing evidence that the bulk of the operations that allegedly exist in China actually exist. No. No. <laughs> Once again, they're buying into the rumor. Uh, and in this case, there is no fact. It's all rumor. That's also the problem with these kleptocracies that we have. They start to believe that their connections actually have real value. So this is why the Carlisle Group guys got involved with the children of Chinese Communist Party members. So they're all confused about uh, the real value that they bring. Right. Also, as we've discussed, this is why in America there's a rejection of science. Uh, because if they were to embrace science, they would have to also embrace reality, and they would have to embrace the fact that the valuations on these deals are nowhere near what they're being marked to market at per the transactions we see in the Wall Street Journal, which itself is owned by a phantasmagorical, slush-peddling, nincompoop and propagandist Rupert Murdoch. My next headline goes exactly with this. I, Volga, puts world's biggest farm up for sale. I think it's iVolga, it could be iVolga, <laughs> but it's the world's biggest farm and it's been put up for sale after being hit by a collapse in grain prices during the world financial crisis and then by droughts and fires that raged across the territories last summer. It's a farming conglomerate which controls 1.5 million hectares across Russia and Kazakhstan. Right, now here's a farm that is losing value due to the climate change and the eco 
economic disaster. They're shelling it for what, a billion dollars or so? Exactly the same as the fake forests that were sold <laughs> to Carlyle Group in China. Right. Meanwhile, you got a company called Zynga. They have a game in cyberspace called Farmville and Cityville that they deal in virtual farming, which is now raising money at a valuation of $8 billion. So there are 95 million people on Cityville and Farmville and other games as virtual farmers, it's worth $8 billion. But the real farm in re real space is not even worth a billion dollars because of the eco-eco disaster of uh, ecological degradation, man-made, and uh, deflation. They did seek outside investors last year. And one of these was um, Altima Partners, a London-based hedge fund. And the principal in charge of agricultural investment there, Dr. Angus Selby, said this, we considered taking a stake, but our view overall was that the risk of political risk and weather exposure in Kazakhstan was too much. So that's another ironic twist to this whole confusing fake with uh, reality and the other way around is that here he's saying is that there's a real risk of climate disasters there. But that's considered a hoax. <laughs> right. The market is saying that man-made climate change is real and it's reflected in the prices. But the people who are on Farmville and Zynga and Cityville in the virtual world, if you told them the reality, uh, they would, of course, have a nervous breakdown. Like the couple in South Korea last year, they were raising a virtual child in cyberspace and neglected their actual child at home who died from starvation. That's playing out on a global scale now. But, you know, this is a good model. F the, the fraud of fake forest is a good model for these guys trying to sell this real farmland. If they can retain their real farmland and they already have an internet ready name of I Volga. Is it anatomically correct farming, I hope? Well, they could sell, sell it to uh, people on their iPads, exclusive to iPad users, buy a share, a virtual share of iVolga, and they could probably get more than a billion dollars. Well, people who are trapped on these virtual online farms could buy their way back into reality by converting their virtual credits into actual dirt and rocks. And then here's another confusion I mentioned, the currencies that nobody knows where any real value is. International Monetary Fund Director Dominic Strauss-Kahn calls for new world currency. How many times do they have to call for this world currency? But this is Dominic Strauss-Kahn, Managing Director of the IMF. He's called for a new world currency that would challenge the dominance of the dollar and protect against future financial instability. So basically, it's the same thing as this SDR, the uh, Special Drawing Rights, but now with a large component of yuan. And he says, using the SDR, to price global trade and denominate financial assets would provide a buffer from exchange rate volatility, while issuing SDR denominated bonds could create a potentially new class of reserve assets. Right. This is would be another layer on the inverted pyramid of fiat currency nonsense. The U.S. dollar was the top layer of the fiat currency pyramid of Ponzi economics, but now that it's going under due to the real estate collapse, which is ongoing, and the societal collapse in America, which is just getting going, uh, they have to bring in a new layer of fiat currency, a global layer, that they're going to roll the dollar into. Yes, but he refers to it as a new class of reserve assets. This is the problem with all of the stories we've been talking about. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. This man thinks he's going to create matter out of thin air, and he's selling it to the public as if a new matter is existing that we can sell to you. It's going to have value. Well, he's a snake oil salesman. He knows he's selling nothing by referring it to it as having some value as an asset, as collateral for some kind of transaction going forward, uh, gives permission for banks to make a market. Once again, a virtual market, dollar-based or euro-based or yen or, or RMB-based, in the new SDR global currency dollar unit of exchange, which itself has no intrinsic value because as you go down and connect all the dots, you find that the underlying earth resources are collapsing and that everybody's addicted to online virtual playing with themselves on these various games using a virtual currency. So there is no intrinsic value. And how about the fact that uh, the IMF is connected to all of these 
Carlisle group like people. So who knows what they're going to put in this SDR? Is it going to be collateralized? Is this new reserve asset going to be collateralized by all these fake forests? They're going to put Farmville in the new well, international but, or currency. how about the one the fraud that is now uh, part of the Carlisle group who are very politically connected people remember George H W Bush George Bush um, uh, John Major the former prime minister of Thailand these guys are there and now we know they've invested in a fake forest in China they've also invested in another fake company in China so are they going to collateral uh, going to put these assets in this SDR well it reminds me of what we saw in Ireland okay the IMF is bankrupt they use the assets of Ireland the energy and the cash in the bank 20 billion dollars as collateral to get a loan on the wholesale market to do a leveraged buyout of Ireland and the people there are saying, yes, we need the bailout. But all they did was give their sovereignty away to a bankrupt institution, the IMF. Okay, so the other thing that's supposed to give more value to this SDR is the involvement of the UN and China in it. Now, let's look at this little clip from Jim Chanos, major hedge fund manager, and what he has to say about what his numbers show about China. There's a big misconception there that, that the Chinese government can do whatever it wants. And the fact of the matter is their banking system is expanding dramatically to do this. I mean, last year, banking credit, traditional credit expanded 25% of China's GDP. And the shadow banking system, we think, expanded another 10%. So total credit outstanding increased about 35% for about 9% GDP growth. So it's taking almost $4 of debt to fuel a dollar of GDP there. And that's just unsustainable. Right, well, that's just marginally better if you would believe the numbers. Uh, the US, it's seven to one, actually, of debt to GDP. So China's saying four uh, dollars of debt for every dollar of GDP. But once again, it's based on forests that don't exist. Uh, you know, pork buns that are made of cardboard, rice from made of plastic. It, fake it, marriages, fake cities, or are cities ghost there? Cities? Ghost cities in China? How much is that worth on Farmville? You know, 37 virtual credits divided by an IMF dollar and an SDR? People, let me explain something to you. The underlying natural resources of the globe that are the basis for the global economy are disintegrating. Until you come to terms with that, no amount of virtual credits on Zynga Farmville is going to save you from extinction. And then finally, one quick headline here. The other component of this global Ponzi or Guanzi scheme, if we want to call it that, my credit card had 79.9% APR. So this is talking about in America, First Premier Bank has launched a new credit card with a sky-high 79.9% interest rate. The card has proven popular with consumers. Over 700,000 people applied for this credit card. So they're just racking up the interest rates as the, the potential for these people ever having a genuine wealth creating job disappears. <laughs> They'll never pay that back and they know it. The US is racking up debts, it'll never pay back and they know that as well. So everyone's just playing this game of suicide economics. Paul Watson, right, at the Sea Shepherd, uh, the captain of the Sea Shepherd, he calls it uh, the economics of extinction, uh, which is why the uh, value of these bluefin tunas uh, in Japan are going up because they're in the freezer and all the bluefin tuna in the ocean are extinct. But the value of the ones in the freezer are going up. So I, presumably at the end of all this, there'll be three or four human beings in the freezer somewhere and the value will be quite high, but the rest of humanity will become extinct. All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming your way, so stay right there. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to speak with Greg Palast, filmmaker, journalist, author of Armed Madhouse, among other books. Greg Palast, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Glad to be with you, Max. All righty. Greg, your latest DVD available on your site, by the way, is called The Bush Family Fortunes. Give us the ballpark figure. What's the Bush family worth? Is it more than the <laughs> Mubarak family? It's hard to say because it depends how much Mubarak gave back. You know, um, you know, that's one of the problems here is that uh, we don't know what these guys are worth. But, you know, that's not the point. It was about how they used it. The film is an investigative report I did for BBC television. And it's how um, they use their money and authority to take control of the security apparatus and ultimately the political apparatus of the United States. Um, I want to move on. You, you make an appearance in this new documentary film, 
uh, peak oil and changing climate. Uh, tell us about the film. Well, I don't know much about the whole film. It's people talking about uh, um, the issue of peak oil, the issue of climate change. And I'm in there to say, to say, you know, it really doesn't matter. That doesn't mean you shouldn't see the film to get information. But it doesn't matter whether we're running out of oil or not because the pollution created by oil is more political pollution. Right now, I am finishing a film on oil for a major British network. And what I'm finding world over is that it's the purchase of governments, the purchase of armies, that is the real pollution that we have to worry about from oil. And it's not a question of whether we're running out of it or not. It's a question of, of we've got to fire the potentates. See, we can march in the streets and say, gee, let's get rid of George Bush or let's get, a, get rid of Mubarak. Mubarak. But the real issue is getting rid of Exxon. The real issue is getting rid of CNUC, the Chinese national overseas oil company. The issue is getting rid of Chevron. Those are the real dictators. The, the political guys, they're just the, uh, the hand puppets. Uh, um, I don't want to talk about the puppets. I want to talk about the hand in, inside the glove that's moving them. And that's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm investigating. Uh, and by the way, you can track those at www.gregpalast.com. I do this. I do mostly investigative reports for BBC television, right for The Guardian. But uh, this will be an independent film for another network. Right, gregpalast.com. And uh, a lot of your work is uh, supported by people who are interested in real investigative journalism. But let's, get, let's talk about this peak oil again. So you're mm -hmm. saying the fact that peak oil, the fact that the cheap oil, the oil that is readily available at an economically viable price is gone, that's not so much the problem that you're focusing on, but the fact that the oil revenues are used to buy uh, governments around the world, and we've got this uh, corrupt global kleptocracy funded by oil reserves. And, uh, okay, let's say that the, the hand in, in the puppet are, are the oil companies, um, and we are not really arguing this point, um, but so, um, again, but we're, we're, we still have a standoff here. What, what, what's the dynamic here? Okay, well, let me give you an example. Problem is, when we are maintaining these petro dictators in power, when we maintain them in authority, uh, it's going to come back and bite us. When those people are in the streets, uh, they want their share. They don't want their resources stolen. And if we, what we've been doing is guaranteeing these puppets uh, a place on stage. I was just in the Caspian Sea region. In fact, I was just busted in the Caspian Sea region doing the story by one of the democracies we support. It was only a few months ago that Hillary Clinton flew into the Caspian and assured the dictators surrounding the Caspian Sea where that's the massive new oil find that uh, the United States was going to continue to back them up. So for all our discussion of democracy, like in e Egypt, I'd be looking at the Caspian Sea. I'd be looking at those places where we still support dictatorship, including, by the way, in Saudi Arabia. You know, on one hand, we, uh, you know, we're saying it's time for Mubar uh, Mubarak to step down because not supported by the people. What about the dictators in Saudi Arabia? You know, Mubarak's problem is that he hadn't developed his oil quick enough. But, uh, you know, if there's an oil state, we've basically guaranteed the dictators. If, and if you want to say, well, that's the price of oil, well, maybe, because you're going to have to defend it. Your kids are going to have to defend it. Your nephews are going to have to defend it. Um, so is it worth it to you? So if it's worth it to you, fill up. Uh, okay, but, but there's another dynamic here. So I understand that you've got oil companies corrupting petro states, and people are tired of having their resources stolen from them and living in poverty in so-called rich countries. But this is not why we saw riots in Tunisia and Egypt and in other places. The reason we're seeing riots is because the price of food and oil are skyrocketing, not because of the oil companies taking over the government, but because they're running out of oil and the price is so high and the food is so high. In other words, uh, nature itself is becoming a factor here. The peak oil story is becoming a factor. Independent of how corrupt the oil companies are, the price is still going higher, and therefore these revolutions are going to happen regardless of the corruption in the oil companies because there's no more cheap oil. There's no more cheap food because you grow cheap food with cheap oil and fertilizer. That seems like the predominant theme here more than corrupt governments and corrupt oil companies. No. <laughs> I'm 
Okay, I'm going to have to totally disagree with you. Okay. Because you're assuming that Mother Nature sets the price of oil. We have cartels. We have the organization Petroleum Exporting Countries, which is, which is an illegal cartel. It's a group of pirates. And uh, Exxon and Chevron ride on their backs while they set the price of oil. You know, when, yeah, we've run out of $2 a barrel oil, but we're buying barrels of oil today at nearly $100 a barrel. Don't blame Mother Nature for uh, a cartel monopolization of the oil. And by the way, oil is a very big part of the Egyptian story. One thing that I've, that I've been stunned about is that uh, I haven't heard much news about the fact that the biggest oil strike of the decade occurred in the Nile Delta in Egypt. That is a big, big part of the story. And the Egyptians know that that oil was struck. And what they want to know is, if we're now an oil nation, what happened to the money? Where did it go? And I can tell you. Where do you think Mubarak got $70 billion? He didn't get it by, you know, selling linen shirts, which is their big export out of Egypt. Um, you know, it wasn't from tourism that he skimmed off the top that his guys, you know, gave you a camel ride and he put it in his pocket. It's the oil. And I haven't heard anyone talk about the oil story in this Egyptian eruption. Well, yeah, the oil uh, in, in, in Egypt is not a new story. In fact, it's a big part of the economy. And recently, they become an oil or energy importer as opposed to an exporter coinciding with these riots. So the Egypt story, they're out of oil. And the price discovery mechanism, you talk about $100 oil, what about two, three, four hundred $400 a barrel oil is what we're talking about because there's simply no more oil. You know, you've run out of oil. The Gawar in Saudi Arabia is uh, running out of oil. Canarel is running out of oil in Mexico. Uh, Bergen in Kuwait, they're running out of oil. This is a, the oil's gone. So uh, this is why people are rioting because uh, they, the food and the oil are, are now disappearing and there's no plan B. So the governments are not going to be around. What I'm saying is these governments are going to go out of business by their own uh, short-sightedness anyway because the oil is gone. I don't see oil being gone. We're, our $100 a barrel price has nothing to do with oil being gone. I don't know of a single place in the planet right now that's pulling up oil that costs $100 a barrel to pull up or $50 a barrel to pull up. Um, in fact, uh, the most expensive reserves being pulled up right now are in Venezuela, the, the heavy, super heavy oil at $30 a barrel, and the Canada tar sands, which is about $28 a barrel. The price of oil today is not in any way, in any way affected by its supply. There is just no connection. It is a monopoly. We've allowed this to continue on. We've allowed basically our oil companies to uh, wink and nod and take part in a cartel, which is holding oil off the market. I can tell you, for example, uh, you know, you have massive, massive find in the Caspian Sea where I just was. Yet, when the Soviet Union pulled out and the wall fell and uh, Azerbaijan became an independent nation, and Azerbaijan, by the way, used to provide 50% of the world's oil, and it can again. The thing is, is that production actually dropped like a bomb, even though it was being run by British Petroleum. The reason was is that when oil was cheap, they simply shut off the spigots. That's very important. And let's not forget that we also lost a lot of oil because we bombed the hell out of the Iraqi fields. That cut off the price of oil. So we have whatever Mother Nature is doing or not, however much there is in the ground, we are, petro, we are now under a petro dictatorship. And that's very important to understand. We have to get off the oil because we have to get, a, because otherwise they have the whip hand on us. And I just don't see it as a question of, of what nature is doing, because we haven't gone down to nature's price yet. <laughs> there's, oh, they, there's, they have in Australia. They, in Australia, they went to nature's price. The cyclones, the forest fires, that's the result of burning oil. That's the result of an inefficient oil market. And that's the result of peak oil. But uh, Greg Pallas, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report again. Max, you're the best. All right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, Greg Pallas for being on the Kaiser Report, and of course I want to thank Stacy Herbert, and I want to invite you to send me an email if you'd like to do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.